Good evening. Welcome to Hard Fire. I'm Ronald Wick, your host for a two-part debate on a film that purports to show that the attacks of September 11, 2001 were an inside job. My guests, Jason Burmis, the guiding light behind the film Loose Change, is joined by his partner and friend, Dylan Avery. I'm sorry, Dylan, who's the guiding light, and Jason, who is the producer, and they are going to tell us why they feel there is significant evidence that shows that members of the American government orchestrated these attacks. On my right is Mark Roberts, who's made it a, a mission to debunk the myths swirling around the events of 9-11. Mark has published a frame-by-frame -frame critique of loose change, and we'd like, to, we'd like to begin by addressing a question to the loose change team. Um, just to provide some context, uh, many critics of the Bush administration feel that um, he and his inner circle ignored warnings that attacks were on the way. Do you think that's a fair accusation? Absolutely. Yeah, that's a very fair accusation. Now, I'm glad we established that because there seems to be some confusion, particularly on the net. There is, in other words, an actual threat from radical Islam. There are real jihadists out there who mean to do us harm. Well, I mean, we never take the position that, you know, uh, militant Islam doesn't exist. Uh, obviously, I believe that there is a radical faction of Islam out there that do want to do America harm. However, I just don't believe that they've ever had the means to carry out attacks, especially as drastic as 9-11. And that, I definitely think that useful idiots, people that think that they're helping Islam, are used as patsies in these larger scale attacks. And on a smaller level, there are definitely those who would be more than willing to strap a bomb to their chest and jump into a mosque or a crowded mall for their political gain. But I, I feel like, you know, I was one of the people that believed the official version off the bat. And radical Islam does exist. We don't take that contention that it doesn't exist. We just don't think that it was the driving force behind the 9-11 attacks. I'm, I'm very glad you made that clarification sure. because there's too much um, confusion on the net where people tend to deny the existence of foreign enemies. Mm -hmm. And y y you find yourself wondering, do these people simply want us to disarm ourselves, to ignore any threat from abroad? Uh, Mark, uh, would you say you've encountered that, that sort of thinking from conspiracists that they... Quite a bit, quite a bit. Uh, there's a, a, a la large thread of people in the conspiracy uh, uh, movement, truth movement, they call themselves, who do believe that all terrorist acts are really committed by the United States. Uh, and uh, these gentlemen have actually said that, th that on their radio shows that they've done, uh, interviews that they've done, um, and so I do think it's a little bit disingenuous uh, uh, because it, one of the things in the movie at least changed is a, a scenario where Flight 93 did not crash in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Um, this is a, a claim. Although and, they recovered 95% of the plane. Well, and, and identified all the bodies. Uh, uh, now, there's a, a tremendous amount of non-evidence that you guys produced to back that claim. Um, and uh, after all of that evidence and scenario is produced, you say, well, what happened to Flight 93? You say, well, we, know, we don't really know. But what we do know is what didn't happen to it. And then you immediately give a quote from Osama bin Laden denying responsibility for 9-11. Oh, Mark, let me just interrupt for a moment. Uh, Dylan, uh, Jason, perhaps you, you'd want to respond to that. Do you still maintain that? Sure. Before we get into 93, I would just like to say, you know, he said that, you know, we go on radio shows and say that, you know, it's all, it's all inside jobs, it's all government. Uh, I, I would disagree, and I would use the example of the 93 bombing as kind of like a counter to that. Mm -hmm. When I said that they use uh, useful idiots, that's a great example, you know. A couple of these guys were low on IQ, you know, they admittedly wanted to do harm to America, but they were infiltrated by an FBI informant called Ahmed Salam. He was an Egyptian army officer, he was recruited by the FBI. Uh, you can listen to the tapes yourself. Uh, he was told to cook the bomb and give it to these guys. And he had them on tape saying they wanted to attack the World Trade Center. They kind of let him loose, and he said, well, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. He had the, uh, I believe, the director of the FBI in New York on tape telling him to go through with the attacks. And it was through him going public that after the fact, when they were all rounded up, 
he was paid for his testimony and wasn't prosecuted with Ramzi Youssef and the others. So I would say that the terror, you know, a certain element of those people, you know, thought that they were doing harm to America. You know, honestly thought that they were, you know, but at the same time it's being provocateur by people behind the scenes. Ah, now, if I can just respond yeah. to that real quick. Uh, the contention that uh, the U.S. government and the FBI in particular actually allowed the 1993 bombings to happen is one that you see a lot, uh, especially on the Internet. The tapes that Jason referred to that this informant, Ahmad Salem, had made um, are uh, actually not all available. Not all. Uh, of not all. No, of them. No, no. Um, and what you do here is uh, no one claiming responsibility, saying go ahead and, and do that bombing. No one from the FBI. It wasn't the director of the FBI in New York. No, I'm an, just an I'm, I'm quoting that from and, the New York and Times so, article. And though. so what, what you do have is a very ambiguous uh, statement about what happened that day. Ahmad Salem was trying to get more money for his informant work. Uh, he had been turned loose before. There's negotiations going on. That's what you do here. Uh, it's an interesting statement, but it's certainly not proof that the FBI allowed the 1993 bombing to happen uh, or ordered it to make it happen. Well, I would just say way. the tapes available are not that of him with the FBI director, okay. but that was reported in the mainstream media. That's yeah, where I'm going. I'm not suggesting okay. that the Oklahoma City bombing isn't a fascinating subject, but mm -hmm. we really do have to return to the, the topic at hand. Oh, sure, that was actually not, that, that was 93 World Trade Center. Yeah, the 93. Yeah, I'm sorry, yeah, the 93 that, yeah. Oklahoma City bombing. No, no, 93 World Trade Center bombing. 95 was the Oklahoma City bombing. Yeah. Yeah. Bombing. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But, in, yeah. <laughs> but in terms in um, in of loose change, loose change second edition and the recut which were released, uh, we we made that film essentially as a bunch of kids. I mean that's yeah. that's the reality of the situation is we were a bunch of kids tackling a subject far beyond the scope of any one documentary. And I will be the first to admit that our film definitely contained errors. It still does contain some dubious claims, and it definitely does come to some conclusions that are not 100% backed up by the facts. Yeah, I, I want I you to not, have the I opportunity will, will the to first, correct the record. You know, absolutely. Anything that I will you be, feel that uh, perhaps you rethink, that perhaps you don't want to commit yourself to any longer, this, this is a good time to bring that up. Sure, out. I'm, I'm just saying that loose change really is not a very fair representation of the 9-11 truth movement. I'd recommend 9-11 Press for Truth, 9-11 Mysteries. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, really 9-11 Press for Truth is really the one you can show to anybody. Uh, it really establishes the fact that the people who were dramatically affected by 9-11 are the ones who violently called for a commission. And they were the ones that were fighting for it. They were the ones that fought to have Kissinger removed from the commission. Yeah. They were the ones that fought to have certain questions raised. Uh, Chris and Breitweiser spent 20 minutes in front of the commission giving them a lecture about how they needed to cover certain issues, and none of their issues got addressed. And it's, it's really a powerful well, piece. Well, I, I had a long conversation with Mike Newman of the National Institute of Standard and, and uh, Technology, and he pointed out that the uh, survivors, uh, the victims' families, uh, the loved ones of the people killed in 9-11, in were instrumental in getting Congress to grant more funds to NIST yes. to do their mm -hmm, work. That's true. And he said, you know, we feel that our work should stand as a legacy to these people. Uh, he says the feedback from them has been overwhelmingly positive. Now, I, I want to get into the NIST report simply because it is so comprehensive. And I find on the net an, a reluctance on the part of conspiracists to engage the specific issues brought up in that report. Sure. I mean, they, they look at a group of 200 researchers and they say, well, they're not telling us what we want to hear, that, that you know, they, they have to be liars. Now, that's before we get into that NIST point, I'd yeah. just like to cover the Flight 93 point because okay. you know, as Dylan, yeah. as Dylan was saying, you know, again, you know, he feels like ninety-five percent of the aircraft was recovered. well. Well, that's what we're say, is said. Yeah. Hold on, I, I wanted to address that point. Ninety-five percent of the aircraft has has been you know recovered, but I've never seen it. And I mean, even with TWA 800, you know, you got to see the hangar after it was you know whatever happened to TWA 800. You know, it hit the ocean and it was dispersed mm. throughout there, and they did put together a large portion of that aircraft. Everybody got to see it. When you look at that Shanksville crash site, it's an open field. There's no fuselage, there's no engines, there's no body parts there. And then you have but reports, there were hold, body on, parts. hold on, hold on, not in that, in that open field. I mean, every, it, cameras were there very quickly. They got no shots of that. And then you do have other reports of three to four miles away, smaller debris fields. And it's reported that maybe eight or nine miles away that they found certain parts uh, of the plane. I, these, are, these are mainstream media reports. And I would like to point out in the first loose change, we do show you the uh, other debris field that I just discussed, the one that's not in the main field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. I'd like Mark to respond sure, because sure. my understanding is that the debris fields are not as far away as sure. three to four miles. Out. Yeah, uh, Jason raised several points uh, to respond to. One of them, and the most important one, I think, being the issue of 
Uh, you don't see these things on video or in photographs. Uh, well, the plane hit the ground outside of Shanksville at 580 miles an hour uh, at about a 40 degree bank, fairly soft soil there. Uh, what you do see lots of photos of, and, and I know you've seen them, there, some of these are in your uh, video, uh, are parts of the plane, small parts. No large parts can survive an a, a, uh, impact like that. We're talking about uh, 850 feet per second. That's the same speed as a uh, 45 caliber automatic bullet. Mm. Um, and so you're going to get small parts. You're especially going to get small parts of something fragile like a human being. And um, you did something that I think is incredibly reprehensible. You used a quote from Wally Miller, who was the Somerset County coroner, uh, a couple of quotes, in fact, in your film, uh, saying that, well, I got there and it looked like uh, 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 someone had dumped a uh, uh, dump truck full of uh, you know, junk out there, said, I haven't seen any bodies. I stopped being a coroner after about 20 minutes. Haven't seen any bodies even a year later. He said, still to this date, I haven't seen a drop of blood. But they identified uh, the victims. But, of course, um, that, that complete, and you left well, it. But Wally but Miller me, wasn't, I'm just saying that Wally Miller finish. wasn't involved in finding out the bodies. Let I mean, me finish. Uh, sure, sure. Wally Miller spent two weeks on his hands and knees picking up pieces of human beings. Yeah. He personally identified 12 of the people through fingerprints and through uh, dental records. Um, the others had to be identified through DNA. Uh, now, I know that you guys have gone on record, at least in interviews, saying that uh, you had tried to contact him and, and weren't able to get in touch with him. Um, but what you've said about him is a completely inaccurate representation of his role. He was on his hands and knees on that site, picking up human remains that could have been our relatives. And uh, he, he takes that role very seriously as a guardian of that site. Uh, he's dealt with uh, all the relatives from all over the country. Um, and uh, uh, to, so to suggest that that's an accurate representation of his role, that there were no bodies there, no body parts there, is utterly false and really, really denigrates the hard work of the people who collected those remains, who identified those remains. If you couldn't talk with him, why not talk with Dennis Dirkmat, who was the chief scientific advisor there, one of the best forensic pathologists in the country. Well, who did talk, talk to, to? Or talk to Paul Sledzik. Well, Let me just finish uh, a sure, second. Sure. Talk yeah. to Paul Sledzik. Um, who is uh, considered maybe the best forensic anthropologist in the country, maybe in the world. He led the DMORT team, Disaster Mortuary Team, at Shanksville. Mm -hmm. There you had uh, over 1,100 people at that site uh, from 74 different agencies and organizations. Not a single one has said there were no bodies, there were no planes there. That plane really landed there. They found the uh, flight data recorder, the cockpit voice recorder. Uh, everything is... Uh, everything was there, and the bodies, and personal effects, and all that. So the representation you gave of that is entirely false. And then what you did is you said, um, we know what didn't happen, and you take Osama bin Laden's word for it, that terrorists weren't involved. Well, before we move oh, on to Osama bin that. Laden, um, sure. do you think that there's perhaps some rethinking in order on, on Flight 93? I've got to tell you, I, I really cannot rethink that when they present evidence well, that it crashed there. Can I just... Yeah, go ahead, sure. sure. Go ahead. That, that, um, and I'll let Dylan finish this up. When they show, you know, things that did survive, such as, you know, the paper, the paper products of C.C. Lyles, they show an unscathed bandana, a red one. Supposedly these hijackers wore red bandanas while they were hijacking the planes. No blood, no sweat, but there no are burn random marks. artifacts in any plane crash. Well, I mean, you know, you would think you would see those random artifacts again. I mean, he's telling, telling us it's a soft dub site. I mean, in that book that you have, 9-11 uh, uh, Myths, they, they say that same thing, you know, it was absorbed by the ground, it was a dump site, that's why I didn't see a lot of the debris. I would just totally disagree and say, you know, to people, make up your own mind, go check out other open field plane crashes, and then s take a look at ours. And but some of the debris was found 30 feet into the ground. The impact of the I plane. I would disagree with that. Well, I, well, sir. I mean, I mean, I'm, we're taking the on, government. On at, well, we're taking the government at its word without them even providing the hangar with the plane. Have you seen the plane in the hangar? I mean, it's five years after the fact. This is an investigation where the NTSB should have been there and taken taken the evidence. Yeah, you didn't see any pictures of NP, well, NTSB no, uh, people the there. The NTSB. Yes, has, I'm sorry, but you do see pictures. Well, of maybe NTSB later. There. Maybe I later. But not on. Not not off bat, Mark. The, the, oh no! Right right there. Uh, the EPA has a website uh, that. So uh, you're has, telling me that those, those guys in, in the gas mask type uniforms and, and the outfits there, those are NTSB guys. The hazmat people. I'm yeah. not sure. I'm not sure where they were from. But well, I would say that the were, hazmat people looked like were, they were the first people on the scene. There were people from you know eight different police departments, ten different fire departments. I know the locals were first there. Sure, but who so 
Ron brought up the question, who have you talked to? Of all those well, 1,100 people. You know, I, I'm well aware of Wally Miller after the fact saying, you know, I don't, I don't believe this. This is conspiracy garbage and everything else. And, you know, people have been hard on for that. He won't talk to us. He's, he said he was not misquoted on those things, but misrepresented. Sure. But misrepresented. And, you know, that's a possibility. I mean, I'm not here to call, you know, Wally Miller a and liar. And see, that's the thing. But I'm here to say that, that, these, that these, are, these are really odd statements to be making about a plane crash. I mean, this isn't, this isn't a plane that hit a building. Obviously, I don't expect them to be able to piece together the planes that hit the World Trade Center. Obviously not. You know, you're in 110 stories of rubble on both sides, you know. Yeah. But in an open field, yeah, I expect to be able to see the plane. I don't think that's a big, I, I don't think that should be a big issue. Yeah, it has been a big issue for us. I mean, that's not one of the things that was released in the Misawi trial. And, but and when they say that they've pieced together the plane using 95 percent, sure, I've seen of about I've seen about now, one percent of that w in the pictures, and they showed well, me a picture of a fuselage four years after the fact, and they showed me I think a picture of uh, what was the other one? Was it a piece of engine? I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, 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 the a second large piece yeah, of yeah, yeah, yeah. There was two pieces that, that right. you could see that were a plane, but that wasn't released again till about four years after the fact. Right. I mean, they but why were those released? It, again, it was uh, only released to the public due to the Misawi trial. Right. Yeah. Because, yeah. because they had been used as they were made public during the trial. But there would have been no reason to keep those from the public. They would have been able to use those as evidence either no, way. No, there, there really is a reason, and that's the reason that we all don't get all the evidence from every crime that comes well, up. Well, that when, would be when, arguing such a, something like the DoubleTree video had, you know, validity in the prosecution of him that, you know, we just got. And after you see it, it doesn't have any validity. Well, but, wait, uh, a point needs to be made here. Sure. There's some evidence that's not going to be available to us, to, to laymen. For example, um, a canard that shows up again and again on conspiracy sites that there were no Arabs on the plains, which on its face is absurd. The reality is the names of the hijackers appear on the passenger manifests. Now, uh, this has been misrepresented. People have said, uh, no, there were no names, and they refer to a CNN victim list, which is not a passenger mm -hmm. manifest. Mm -hmm. If you or I try to get hold of a passenger manifest from the FAA, we simply can't do it. Mm -hmm. The way I found out about the passenger manifest was by calling the Boston Globe, and I asked them, look, you published seating positions mm -hmm. of the hijackers. How did you know where they were where they were seated? FOIA. And they mm -hmm. said, well, look, I mean, it's not hard. We simply got the passenger <coughs> manifest, and the, these are their seating positions. Mm -hmm. Now, they can do that. We can't. But nevertheless, that's not a reason for saying that there were no Arabs I on mean, the yeah, plane. I mean, absolutely not. You're, but that's not, right. that's not yeah, something that, that we've ever contended. I no, mean, the only no, contention that we've that. made is that they did not show up on the autopsy list at the Pentagon. You know, but that was very curious. Again, the list that you show on your video says, here's a list of victims victims, identified victims, okay? It doesn't say hijackers here's the list are not of victims. hijackers are not victims, although I had a guy at Ground Zero well, contend I mean, that they were. I but, mean, uh, with, with that and Hani Hanj are not apparently having even a ticket. And the, I mean, they uh, originally... That was later disproven. Yeah, yeah, well, that was later disproven. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But originally they had actually said it was a different Arab man other than Hani Hanj. Or. We, we just really feel like, like when you look at these hijackers' backgrounds, mm -hmm. you know, what they did on the run-up to 9-11, and then, you know, Robert Mueller making statements like, you know, this is an open investigation, and then, you know, mainstream media in other countries, and, and sometimes in this one, reporting that some of these guys may be alive or even dead before the fact. One of the they guys... They all turned out to well, be... Well, I would just say, know, I mean, false, look at, look at Khalid Al-Madar for a second, yeah. all right? Khalid Al-Madar was reported possibly alive by CNN after the fact, but then uh, there was also reported that he might have been dead a year before the attacks. Mm -hmm. You know, these are just numerous anomalies and you think it would be pretty easy to get the names they did of the Arab these up by November well by I, would say, November. I would say November 2nd, I would say I would say I thought it was late November no, I would say yeah. that that's not entirely true I mean Walid al Shiri said he saw his picture on television a lot of people will say oh these are just radio reports they might have gotten the names wrong but Walid al Shiri you know he said he was a Moroccan pilot he said he said he had seen himself and I know that the BBC has recently wrote a retraction saying that all these guys are dead but I haven't heard his family story or his sto story, so I don't know why I should believe them. This is the same, you know, government that when three of the hijackers listed their home, I mean, listed their home addresses as Pensacola Navy Station, they said that it was mistaken identity, and we have to take their word for that. Well, and I'm again, just not willing to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well I think when you, but when you look into it mm -hmm. more deeply, uh, you realize that there are rational explanations for these things. Mm -hmm. the, the people at Pensacola Naval Station you just mentioned, Pensacola trains lots of foreign pilots. They sure. say they've had 1,600 people they've trained there with the name Saeed. Mm. Uh, they had uh, many with uh, Saeed al Ghamdi. That was one of the prominent ones. Mm -hmm. Now, I believe it was his or another one of the, uh, uh, the hijackers used that address, uh, but they used 
phony uh, social security numbers. One was 30 years out of date. Uh, uh, and then you have the other issue of other people having similar names to the hijackers. When you get this sort of fog of war thing happening immediately after the event, uh, for instance, one uh, person's picture was put up. You can't, you know, the camera won't be able to quite make this out, but uh, uh, was put up on the internet by the FBI. Uh, is that the guy I just met, I and, mentioned, uh, uh, the guy who was later replaced by Hanjar? This is uh, Abdulaziz Alamari. Okay. Uh, and uh, they got that wrong. He is a pilot. He is a pilot. They hmm. thought he was uh, the uh, Alamari who was the hijacker. They got it wrong. They put his picture up. He said, hey, wait a minute. That's me. I'm here alive. So it's one of those things that you're referring to where someone said, that is not me. There's another Abdulaziz Alamari who said, that's not me either. Hmm. Um, so they did eventually get the right guy. And that guy also made a video saying, a martyrdom video, um, saying that I'm going to do this thing, uh, as did uh, Muhammad Atta and Ziad uh, Well, Jara. that, that video is pretty much video. up for grabs. I mean, there's no yeah. audio for that, Mark. Even well, you have to contend that. What about that. the, uh, the um, terrorists who were trying to buy GPS systems? Now, I think it was Hanjur who bought one, and he tried to buy three others and mm -hmm. couldn't get them. And mm -hmm. then Atta bought three of his mm -hmm. own. Now, again, this is the kind of thing that comes up on the net. I'm, I'm not accusing you guys mm -hmm. of, uh, of believing these more far-fetched mm -hmm. theories. But we're all on the same page. There were Arabs on the plane. I think so. Okay. I think that they were definitely. I mean, Arabs I think they were definitely involved. In yeah, and I think okay. that they were played off as, as patsies. I believe that you know Muhammad Atta. Muhammad Atta is a prime example. Yeah. All right. For, first of all, Muhammad Atta trained in the Montgomery Air Force Base. All right. Maxwell Air Force. Ma Maxwell Air Force. I'm yeah, sorry. Right. In Montgomery, Alabama. And like he said, you know, a lot of Arabs do get trained out, outside of that. But uh, what I found interesting is that. James Woods, the actor, went public on a few stations, even Bill O'Reilly, for, for God's yeah. sakes, and said he, they, in the summer before 9-11, he had gotten on a plane. Uh, four Muslim men in matching windbreaker outfits had gotten on the mm -hmm. plane. No luggage, made them really nervous, said they were always looking at the, uh, the cockpit every I time the door opened. Interview. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then he had actually went up to the, uh, the stewardess on the plane, and this was in uh, a recent Maxim interview where he revealed this, and they both filled out FAA reports right after the flight. They were that spooked. Two of the guys ended up being supposed hijackers on the list. Now, if that had been me or you on that plane that had been in these windbreakers, I can almost guarantee you even in 2001 we would have been questioned and detained. But, but they didn't well, seem actually, to get those. Well, that's a misconception. I, I would disagree, sir. Uh, they're just sir. not as competent as, as, as well but that. Listen, uh, if someone files an FAA <laughs> report yeah. a, an FAA report, and they know the seat numbers, and one of those persons is a flight attendant that works for the airline, I really do believe that the authorities would take it seriously. I, I can give you a personal anecdote. I don't want to take up too much time, but I was on a flight back from Las Vegas in November of 2000. Now, this is a good nine, month, uh, nine almost ten months before the attacks. A guy created a disruption. The plane had taken off. He's using his cell phone. People are telling him to put that away. The stewardess is, you know, trying to. The guy won't do it. Uh, finally, two rather burly stewards show up. He stuffs the thing under his seat, you know, and his clever ruse doesn't work. You know, they take the cell phone away and make him turn it off. After 2001, I called the FBI to talk about this incident. I said, look, this, at the time, I thought this was just a, a, a rowdy jerk. Uh, someone who didn't want to leave it in Vegas, and uh, they said they'd get back to me. Never heard a word. I, you Nothing. know, well, again, I, I, the, I would think that they are a little more competent than this, that, uh, well, I would, especially I would with that kind of a threat. I would say that the hijackers are, are a lot more competent than you give them credit for. The idea that they're just patsies and maybe not quite capable of pulling off this, well, this thing or, or I think not, they were good maybe not what quite they smart did. enough. Well, they were very intelligent. They were very patient. They are ruthless. Um, if you look at the embassy bombings of How do you know they're ruthless, man? I mean, I'm not trying to be mean, but I mean, you don't well, know these guys personally well, off the bat. Well, Jason, the, the passengers from the planes told us. <laughs> I haven't gotten to hear those tapes of you. I mean, I mean, listen, I'm all for evidence, and if people are ruthless or are, are evil people, I would categorize them as such. And if they did pull these attacks off, slitting people's throats with box cutters or small knives or whatever you want to think, obviously ruthless, but we don't know that. And see, that's a, reason, that's a, a yes. reason to doubt I have a very the, good the reason to doubt that. I have, a, I have a reason to doubt that the hijackers were ruthless as you describe them. I have people who described Hanjur as meek. Uh, he was too shy to ask for a toothbrush when he was staying with a house guest while he was going to flight schools. Uh, you know, he could barely speak English. Ziad Jarrah, 
His girlfriend, Sengwen, back in Germany, says that he was a wonderful guy. She never heard any mention of any of the alleged hijackers. The only one years. who had a girlfriend who kept relations with his family at all was Jarrah. All the rest of them had broken off relations with their families. I'm just saying, a lot, of these, alleged, history on all a lot of these, of these alleged ruthless muscle hijackers and a lot of these pilots have a very dubious past. Ziad Jarrah was actually proved at one point to be in two different places at the same time. He was back home in Germany and he was also having an apartment in Brooklyn at the same time. And these were two men whose photos matches each other. But what you need to do, and what the viewers need to do, is to read the 9-11 Commission report. It is, it is extensive. It goes into these histories. It goes into their travel. There are separate staff monographs, separate reports just on the tourist travel, and, uh, terrorist tra travel and finance. It is very extensive. And uh, you get a sense that this was planned for a very long time. Uh, and that these people are very bright. They negotiated the, the American system very well. They were tra the pilots were trained. And I just want to say the majority of that information, though, that uh, on these guys was from uh, interrogations into Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, correct? Mm -hmm. And who was who was I would just like to say who was supposedly captured and then executed without us ever seeing any kind of a trial. And before that, he had been reported dead and captured. Uh, in two different occasions, of course, they say, you know, mistaken identity, identity, we really didn't get them. But then again, you know, it seems like they used these guys several times. But Ramsey bin Al Sheib, we still have in custody. And well, he's, again, he's, he's, the one he's who another guy, though. Given, I mean, Mark, they can say you have, they have er, anybody. My point is, why aren't we making this what more they, public? What they've said is fits with everything else that we know. Well, this I, is not, this I just is wanna, not just random stuff I, out in the middle of nowhere. I would it say all that. fits. I just, I just want to drop back to Ada for one more moment. All right, the, the two things that really bother me about Ada is, A, he took his will on the plane that he knew he was going to crash into, you know, uh, the World Trade Center. It didn't make it onto his, his uh, connecting flight, which is just amazing. You know, the guy brings his will on the plane, but it doesn't make it there. And then they go into his car, into his Nissan, and they find papers in effect that would have convicted two other people who they later cleared. So these two people that they found the, the paper, like paperwork on these guys were going to hijack and they had their identification, they got cleared. So why does Mohammed Adda's Nissan Altima have two people's uh, you know, effects in his car that aren't involved in this? That, that to me was very strange. And just that's just another thing to say. Thing well, to Dylan's me. been itching. Too. Yeah, okay, I'm sorry. We're, we're going to have to uh, put this over to the next show. Uh, sure. I would like to remind people there are a few resources that they should make use of. The book Debunking 9-11 Myths by the Popular Mechanics Team. The site 911myths.com, which features Mark's work. You can find his critique of loose change. And of course, your film, Loose Change, which can be downloaded on the net. Uh, I think you should read all of these. And until next week, when we will resume this debate, I'd like to wish everyone on behalf of my guests good night, and we hope to see you again very soon.